Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first uh, series and the uh, first event in a series of trainings we're doing this fall at Jackson Systems University. Uh, my name is James Yarnell. I'm one of the account managers here. Uh, thank you all for coming. We've got a quite a cast of characters in here this evening, uh, so we're glad you could make it. And uh, thank you online and uh, internet land for joining us. If you have any questions, you can type it in the Q&A box and I will actually read it from the computer here in the room. And I'll go ahead and ask our presenter the night, tonight the question for you. And also, this is a first for us, we are going to be doing a couple poll questions uh, throughout the presentation. And when, the poll, when uh, our presenter asks the question, uh, the poll will be presented on your monitor. You can then select your answer. We'll have real time feedback on how you feel about whatever the question is. So it's kind of a cool little thing we're doing. So we'll see how that goes. So our presenter tonight is Mr. Tim Burke from White, White, White Rogers. That always gets me. And uh, <laughs> he is here to talk about flame rectification. Tim, come on up. Hey, James. Good to see you, White Rogers. White Watches. That always gets me. It sounds like Crippy off yeah. of uh, Big Bang Theory. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he's been here before, folks, and he I can tell you he does a fantastic job uh, teaching, presenting this. He really knows what he's talking about. How long have you been doing this? I started uh, as an apprentice in 1976 and 1981 out in the field full time. Yeah, so he knows what he's talking about, folks. So if you have any questions about anything he's going to be referring to, now's the time to ask because this guy knows his stuff. Believe me, he's been here before. I've seen it, and it's, it's great. So please pay attention. And uh, I'll let you do your thing. Thank you, sir. Sounds good, James. Man, you overbuilt me. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, everybody? Good to see you tonight and out there in Internet land, as you call it. Uh, we're going to talk about flame rectification and flame proving theory tonight. It's that time of year. I was driving up from St. Louis, Missouri, where I'm from. We're in Indianapolis right now, and the temperature dropped when a storm came through from the upper 70s down to the mid 60s in like 20 miles. It's cold, or at least cool. So now we're starting to see the trucks starting to roll. We're doing the cleaning checks. Furnaces are firing off for the first time. So hopefully, guys, the phones are going to ring off the wall for you if you're out in any kind of heating area. So we'll go through the flame rectification this evening, and I'm going to approach it from a troubleshooting and a technician standpoint on some little tricks that you ought to be doing starting now, especially with these cleaning checks coming up. So if we can go to the next slide, we'll get started up here. Oh, I got to do the slides. Are you going to make me work? <laughs> I guess I could do that. All right, so this is a NATE certified course. As they told you, send in your NATE number. Make sure you give us the NATE number and we'll get it in. It'll be one hour of CEU credit. All right. So we're going to start off with thermocouples. Just a few slides on that because we're talking about flame proving. And to give you a little background, there was a guy by the name of Thomas Seebeck. Called the Seebeck effect is what he discovered that we originally started using for flame proving. We used this back in the 20s and the 30s when we started using central furnaces. And when you look at the Seebeck effect, what he was able to figure out is that if you have two kinds of metal with a different mass, different atomic weights, and you heat those metals up, they actually produce electricity, millivolts, literally. So when you take a look at the Seebeck effect, as we're talking about here, what we have, and I'm going to slip on behind, these are just two basic little metal wires. And if you ever open a thermal couple up, you'll see what I'm talking about, a sixteenth of an inch wide or so. They're different weights. And what we're going to do is we're going to heat up at the tip these two different metals. And what happens when you heat metal, you create heat, right? You also create the electron movement. When you drive that heat, you force electrons to push away from the heat. And so what happens is the electrons start coupling down here. Well, because they're two different atomic weights, the difference between this and this is the excess electrons, hence that's where the voltage comes from. So a thermocouple, about 30 millivolts, typically is how we rate them, is generated by heat. And that's enough to hold in a small little magnet that I'll show you on a gas valve for a standing pilot. You'll see those on storage water heaters. Uh, they're still used in some wall heaters, uh, light commercial applications for unit heaters. But all the residential stuff is, of course, gone to flame rectification, which I'll get into very heavy in just a little bit. So here's what occurs. You got the pilot burner right here. You light it with a match after holding down the knob. And when you do that, the electrons start getting forced off. What you have over here is a gas valve, and it's literally got a small electromagnet wire, wire, windings on it. So when you push down on the gas cock right here, 
you slam that home on the magnet, if you produce electricity with the heat, it's enough to hold the magnet closed, which means the gas will flow through the pilot tube. And of course, you'll have that standing pilot, meaning the pilot is on all the time. Pretty basic operation. I think we've all lit those at one time or another. If you want this, we can send it to you. This is just a nice little check. If you're ever doing any water heating work, or if you guys are, have any plumbers out there or HVAC guys doing service work on standing pilot, you can check standing pilots to see how much millivolts it's putting out in what they call an open circuit, which is where you pull the thermocouple off and you have just that little button down at the end. You can check it as no load or you can check it closed. Closed meaning it's attached to the gas valve. And typically on a gas valve, you'll see two little 316 spades right where the thermocouple gets screwed in. Normally an ECO, an emergency cutoff or energy cutoff switch is tied to that, a thermal fuse. You can actually measure it under load here. As an open circuit, when it's just hanging up in the wind, 17 millivolts is the bottom threshold. With no load, 17. So it'll be somewhere between 17 and 30 millivolts. If you're getting that, it's putting on enough voltage to hold the magnet in. You don't have a bad thermocouple. If it's down in this range down here, it's not putting on enough voltage. It could be either A, the pilot burner is not producing enough heat. You don't have it immersed about three-eighths of an inch into the flame or your thermocouple is becoming defective. So that's for the open circuit where it's actually hanging out in the air. If it's on the gas valve, that is closed circuit and that's a little bit different under load. Instead of just having a go, no-go type situation over here, we have a band, a good range between 10 and 20 millivolts. So checking in under load, less than 10, more than 20, you have a suspect defective thermocouples. So just a little fun fact for thermocouples. That's not why you guys are here. What's a thermal pile? Anybody know what a thermal pile is? Usually they're about three, three eighths of a barrel, three eighths inch diameter. And a thermal pile works just like a thermocouple, but all you're doing is you're adding a whole bunch of thermocouples inside to produce more voltage. You might have 10 or 20, sometimes 30 of those little wires all embedded in there in series. And as you heat them up, each one produces 25, 30 millivolts. You have 10 of them, it'll be 300 millivolts. You have 20 of them, it's 600 millivolts. And it works under the same principles. All of these wires get heated up. The dissimilar atomic weights of the metal, you have leftover electrons, and that's what holds in your line interrupter and also will have a relay. That'll open up for the mains there. If you lose power to the line interrupter, the mains can't open up. You don't have operation of the heating system. So a thermal pile could be a 300 millivolt, could be a 600 millivolt, 750. A little fun fact, make sure if you're replacing thermal piles, you get the right voltage. I had a tech service call well, it was sometime last heating season from down in Asheville, North Carolina. And it was the strangest thing. He told me that he could get it to work as long as he held it down and then hit the side of the gas valve with a screwdriver and it worked fine. And I said, sir, that's not the way a gas valve is supposed to work. What occurred was he had a 300 millivolt thermal pile that he bought from the distributor. The gas valve was a 750 millivolt. So when he tapped it on the side, all he was doing was jarring things loose. It was not operating correctly. After going through some troubleshooting and checking the ranges like I did before, we were able to figure out he had the wrong voltage thermal pile. So always ensure you know what you're replacing with the right millivolt thermal pile. That's a little fun fact. Okay, now let's get into flame ratification. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put up a polling question here. Oh, I don't see the polling question. Should I not? Do they see it now? Yeah. I didn't screw it up? <laughs> okay. All right, the question is, what is the top furnace-related issue you're going to run into in the first couple months? And I'm asking you to rate it on the number one reason. Now, there's four on there that you'll see. You know, it could be a uh, dirty air filter. How many times is that going to happen? It could be that the unit starts to light off, it holds in for about five seconds and shuts down, and it keeps going, 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 restarting, restarting. It could be a flame ratification problem. It could be that some little child was down. I just had this happen earlier this year. Little child went down, 
turn the switch off on the side of the furnace. Had to call the contractor. Car contractor, he should have charged them, and he did. Had to get paid for a one-hour service call. These types of things happen all the time. So what we're going to try and figure out is, what do you think is going to be the top-rated one that you're going to have? So let's see where the poll numbers are coming in. Have we are starting to get any polls yet? We have a few people answering. Uh, give another minute or so. No problem. So no, anybody know any good jokes? <laughs> I don't know if you guys realize this, but there's a 45 second lag from the time I do something to the time you actually see it happen. So that's why we're uh, tap dancing a little bit right now. Okay. Do I do it here? Yeah, on there, yep. Okay. Sorry, guys, I'm new to this pulling thing, too. Is that the results there? Okay, what did you have? 75% said what? Dirty flame throws piston will not, will not rectify. That was number, number one, 75%? Okay. And then finally, the third one, the system power switch will turn its turn off. Okay, great. We now have how many people online out in internet land? I can't see it. A whole bunch of you? Wrong. <laughs> you thought it was going to be a flame rectification question to tee up for it? No. Believe it or not, it's going to be the furnace filter. You're going to run into that so many times over the next few weeks as we start going into the heating season. The furnace filter is number one. Now, Here's where I'm going with this. The flame probe generally is number two. But think about it. If you do a service call and you replace the filter, how much do you charge the homeowner for that? Do you really make any money on changing filters if it's just a clogged filter? You'll cover your cost, but do you make profit? So when I start getting into the flame rectification, I'm going to show you some tricks on even if you're just replacing the filter or you have to clean the probe or replace the probe, I'm going to show you some tricks on how to look for other things during that startup that might give you an opportunity to actually generate a few more revenue dollars by replacing another component. It's called the 15 second spot check and I'm going to get into that. So the number one answer quite honestly was B, dirty return air filter. All right. So let's get into our scenario. My old friend Mrs. McGillicuddy. All right, here's the scenario. She's got an 80% natural gas, single stage, non-integrated HSI. It's been in service for 12 years. She's on your book, so you every year, you go out and you do your service. You know it's been cleaned. You know it's been maintained. She pays her bills on time. The kind of customer you want. When she wakes up today, for example, when it got cold, it's cool in the house. It's 60 degrees. She's uncomfortable. She turns the thermostat on. No heat comes on. So she calls you up, and here's the scenario. It's an HSI system, so the glow bar starts burning cherry red. You hear a click, the gas valve opens, and you hear the ignition, you see the blue flame. But it only lasts for about five or seven seconds. Then it goes out. What is the problem? What do you think it is? Dirty flame probe, right? And what's the first thing you guys are going to do? Exactly. You're going to clean the flame probe. You're going to get out your emery cloth or whatever, and you're going to buff that thing out so it's so shiny you could shave in it. You're going to put it back in. Voila, everything starts working. I used to do that. I was in the field, guys. I was a technician. I did service work. And I would shine those babies because I knew Mrs. McGillicuddy. This was actually a call I did early in my career in the early 1980s. And I had learned about carbon oxide coming on the flame probe, and I learned how to polish it off, not scratch them, all the good stuff they tell you to do. And that thing was shiny as could be. I pulled off the job, gave her the invoice, did my thing for the next couple of weeks, out and run service, doing all the stuff. All of a sudden, I walked into the office one morning, and Andre, who was the service manager at the company I worked for, says, Tim, you remember Miss McGillicuddy? I said, yep. She goes, what would you do on that job? I said, I clean the flame pro. That's what we learned in the class. Buff it out, make it nice and shiny. He goes, it's doing it again. Go out there and take care of it. And I'm thinking, 
man, I cleaned the probe. What's the problem? So I went out there. I looked at the probe, and it had a little discoloration on it. It was some of that gray powder you see sometimes. So I took it out, and this time, man, I really polished this sucker. I must have taken off the entire film, got it just perfect. It looked brand spanking new. Put it back in, didn't charge her, so we ate the call, the callback cost. Miss McGillicuddy, you're ready to rock. Everything's good for the rest of the season. Pulled off the job, went back to work. All right, so that was two weeks the first one. Two weeks later, the second call. I'm working four weeks later. Now, this is cold in St. Louis where I'm at. It was one of those days where it was about 20 degrees and the sleet's coming sideways across the interstate. I finally get into the office and Andre is waiting for me at the door. And you could tell when he was upset. He was a, a tiny guy and he had a heck of a temper. Short guy, but boy, he was scary when he got mad. He says, Tim, you remember Mrs. McGillicuddy? I said, yeah. He goes, I got news for you. It's doing it again. You're going back out there. This time you're going out during your lunch hour. And you're going to fix that on your time. I'm not paying you to go back three times to a job. I said, no problem. I'll take it. And I'm going to be there with you. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when the boss shows up on a job you've been working on to double check your work, you get a little skittish, right? So Andre meets me out at the job site. We look inside. Sure as heck, the glow bar starts lighting up. It opens the gas valve, lights the gas. Flame comes on. Six seconds later, shuts off. We look inside, the, and Andre, he let out with a curse word. He went over to the furnace, and he goes, bah! and he kicks it. Put a dent in the furnace, by the way. I didn't want to tell Ms. McGillick I did that. And I look at this guy, you're nuts. Guess what? The furnace started working. And I'm looking at Andre. I'm looking at the furnace. If we fired it off again, I'm looking at him. I'm looking at the furnace. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, you're the service god, Andre. No wonder you're the manager, right? What was the problem? And it wasn't the flame probe. What did I miss? What did I miss? I'm a journeyman, guys. I went through a four-year apprenticeship. I should have known this. What do you think I missed? What's that? Mm -hmm. It had to do with the ground. Exactly. The ground. I didn't even think about it. Let's go through and understand how flame rectification works. And don't make the same mistake I did. Because here's what's going to occur. As soon as you go in on that second call, the first thing I did was I cleaned the probe. And I moved all the wires out of the way to get that probe out of there. As soon as you start moving wires around, especially if one of them's the ground wire, you move it enough, it's going to make firm contact again. Let's go through the circuit and understand how these things work. I'm going to show you a 15 second spot check. You guys that are watching, the people that work with you, let them know about this technique. It's a way for you to avoid a callback. Because generally, guys, when we don't get it right the first time and we got to go back out, we eat the cost. And when you look at what it costs for one of us to go out there in our truck, it may be $100 for an hour's work or whatever it is for your business model. It's money out of pocket. And more additionally, that's one hour that you're not out fixing stuff where you can actually generate profit. It hurts. It's actually when you add it, one hour lost time plus an hour of billable time, that's two hours in a week you lost for a callback. Let's avoid that. What I'm going to do is an electrical check on a flame circuit that takes me literally 15 seconds, literally. And I'm going to check the igniter. I'm going to check the primary polarity. I'm going to check the phasing of the system. Because remember, furnaces have 120 volts primary, 24 volts secondary. Verify polarity on the secondary, and I'm going to check the ground. Because I got news for you. If any one of those things are not operating correctly, you're not going to have a system that's going to maintain heat. It's not going to light off and stay lit off. It won't rectify. So let's go through understanding how to do the 15 second spot check. <coughs> First off, the igniter. And you would think this is an obvious thing I'm going to say. But unfortunately, I was out in the field and I know now that probably you guys are no different than I was. When I'm out there on a job, I fix something, and then I'm going to fire it off to make sure it's working. I go ahead and jump around that W to R, starts lighting off. What am I doing the whole time it's warming up? I'm picking up my tools and throwing them in the box, and I'm kind of cleaning up to make sure everything's fine. I'm not looking at the inside of the furnace. I'm just making sure it lights and stays lit, period. We all do it. What is this you see right here? Anybody know what that is? It's called a hot spot. See how almost white? 
just a little bit off of white. That's a really hot temperature. That's about 22, 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. Really hot. If you actually look at all this thing, what I did was I needed the picture, and so I cheated. What I did was, if you go to the distributor, you know, they always pull out the igniters. What's the first thing you do, by the way? Matt, when you buy an igniter, the first thing they do is they open them and say, hey, look, it's not broke. Put it away and they give it to you. Well, anyway, what I needed was a picture of a broken igniter. So I took a little screwdriver, I put it in here, and I turned it just enough to put a hairline crack in the igniter right here. Then I went to the lab and I fired it off with 120 volts. Warmed it up, got my picture. Boom, I'm ready to start my training module, right? So I pull off and I'm starting to walk back to my office. And I made it about halfway there. And it hit me like a thunderbolt. What is the temperature of that white spot? Well in excess of 2,000 degrees. Will that light gas? Yes, Skippy, it will. In fact, any of this region here will light gas. And it occurred to me, wait a minute, even a broken igniter, if it's glowing, it's going to light the gas. How long will that work? Obvious question, right? So I went to one of our technicians and I said, do me a favor. Put this thing on a cycle counter and I want you to warm it up for 30 seconds, shut it off for 30 seconds, warm it up 30 seconds, shut it off, go on and on and on. I want to know how many times I can warm that thing up until eventually that crack gets big enough that it can't bridge and I get no glow. I get no contact or continuity. Because right here, even though I got a hot spot of high resistance value through a crack, that'll like gas. Anybody want to guess how many cycles I got out of that puppy? Over 1,200 cycles before it finally got big enough where it broke. In St. Louis, that's almost a full heating season. So the point I'm making in the 15 second spot check, watch the igniter from the time you turn it on to the time it ignites and look for the hot spot. And if you have a hot spot, what do you do about it? Chris, what would you do if you have a hot spot? How would I sell to the homeowner I got to fix this? You don't just go ahead and replace it without their permission. It's real simple. Grab the homeowner and take her to the furnace and say, ma'am, you see that right there? I know your system's heating, but you got a crack in your igniter. And what's your first question going to be? Exactly. There's a crack in the igniter. I don't know. Because she wants to know how long it's going to last. Every time. Every time. Your answer is going to be, I don't know, six months, three months, tomorrow? <laughs> I have no idea. What do you want me to do about it? And at that point, she'll either say, replace it. Or she'll say, wait, I don't have enough money right now. Wait until it breaks all the way. I'll call you back when it happens. Generally, they want it replaced right away. The beauty of this is, there's no argument about the replacement. More importantly, she's going to call your company back for the service because you identified a potential problem. You start building that relationship with your consumer, and that's really important to do. So, even though they have a crack, they'll like gas. When you do your cleaning checks over the next four or six weeks, look for that crack. You see it, drag the homeowner down there and ask them what they want to do about it. Nine times out of ten, Instead of just getting your clean and check where you break even, you sell an igniter. It might cost you, what, 20, 30 bucks, whatever the number is. You're going to sell it for 100, 150 bucks to cover your labor cost. All of a sudden, you're making profit on a stupid call like that. Or if it's a replacement filter, you're actually making some profitability. So that's one of your first tricks. Secondly, I have had innumerable people always asking me, can you check the resistance to see if there's a crack? Yes, you can. But I got to be honest with you, after doing this literally for 35 years plus, a visual inspection will tell me what's going on a lot quicker than cold ohms because I've seen below 40 and above 75 on a Norton style silicon carbide igniter that have lasted many, many heats and seasons past the resistance when I checked it. You know, it, it's one way to do it. Personally, I look for a crack. So here's your first fun fact. Let's get into the electronics. Now it's going to get a little hairy. I'm going to get a lot more technical. All this stuff has been softballs to this point. Let's start in to understand how flame rectification actually works. I'm going to do it from a contractor technician perspective. What you see here is a sine wave, S-I-N-E. And what a sine wave is, is electricity in alternating current going plus and minus 60 times a second. We all get that, right? 60 hertz frequency. That's a sine wave. This represents 
one sixtieth of a second. So what you have literally occurring is you start at zero in a sixtieth of a second and it's going to start ramping up to a plus voltage, climbing 80, 90, 120 volts. It'll peak out. Then it'll start going negative. 120, 110, 90, 80, 70, 60, zero, negative 10, negative 20, 30, 40, negative 120, and then back. Literally, it is continually cycling. It's moving. It's not just a constant 120 volts. There's your sine wave. Here's your zero cross right here. This is a 60 hertz frequency. I mean, if you don't believe me, think about the last time you shocked yourself with 120 volts. <laughs> I mean, why are you shaking? Because you're every other cycle, half cycle, you're the ground. And that's when you get shocked. It's not continuous. That's why it's a pulse that you can feel going through your body instead of consistently. Because of plus and minus. All right, so there's a sine wave. The way we do flame rectification, nobody really understands what we're doing here. I know we check microamps and we do this crazy stuff with the meters, it's not that hard. We literally, on the boards, we put out 100 volts AC on a flame rectification circuit on an ignition module. We're putting straight AC through it, and what we want to do is we want to take that to a flame probe. It may look like this. Here's the board, 100 volts goes through the wire, and literally you can check with a voltmeter between here and ground, and you'll see about 100 volts AC. And what we want to do is, we want to use the flame as a switch. When the flame is present, we want to pass that voltage through the flame, and we want to find ground. Because electrons will not flow unless they find a path to ground. There's no ground, they don't flow. They don't flow, you don't get anything working. Make sense? So when we're doing this, we need to understand what happens to the electricity, the electrons, the sine wave, when it goes through the switch called a flame. Now, a flame will conduct electricity. Can anybody tell me why a flame conducts electricity? Did you know it does? It does. It's the byproducts of ignition. The byproducts of ignition are hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and a whole bunch of other chemicals I can't spell or pronounce. Carbon is an insulator, meaning it will not conduct electricity. Hydrogen and oxygen, when combined, creates H2O, which is water. Is water a conductor? Yes, it is. So you got good stuff in the gas when it's burning, and you got bad stuff, insulators and conductors. And so literally, it allows the voltage, 100 volts AC, coming through the probe, right here, comes on through, hits that flame, and because it has conductive materials in the flame, allows it to find the path to ground. And where is ground inside of a furnace? It's the entire burner vestibule. It's all metal. We don't use plastic on burners. We use metal. And it's conductive. So anywhere the flame is touching, it's hitting ground. So the flame is there. If there's no flame, what happens? Nothing. Because you don't have a path to ground, electrons don't flow. you got to have flame present. Now, I'll give you this. The flame is a very high resistive value. It's not a great conductor, but it does conduct electricity. 100 volts here wants to find ground. So you guys cool with that so far? Let's get into it a little deeper. I'm going to do a quick polling question here. Let's see if I can um, screw this up this time. I'm going to try better this time. Oh, okay, so I don't need to do it yet? Okay, I apologize. This is new to me, too. Okay, so the polling question will be coming up here, and I already gave you the answer. Let's see if you're paying attention. Why does flame conduct electricity? Could be the corona effect, and I'm not talking beer, the corona effect of the actual flame. Answer B is the byproducts of ignition that contain moisture, hint, or spiritual intervention, which I do believe in God, so that may come into play too. Spiritual intervention. So which one is it? A, B, or C? I better get 100% on this one, James. Yeah, we'll see. We'll find out, right? I don't know it. <laughs> Fortunately, James is not on the tech services line. <laughs> Been enough time for me to go ahead and go over? Roll it. Yeah, you told me how to do it here. Let's see if oh, I you got it? All right, thank you. 
Yeah, all this technology. Alt and tab. You got it? Cool. We're starting to get some information flowing in. Ninety-three point three percent got it right. Seven hundred percent didn't. So wake up, will you? Or you've been having the Corona effect. You've had too many Coronas after work. <laughs> Seven percent was on the Corona effect. So we've been hitting the bar. All right. Are we back up with the uh, slide? Are we good? All right. Thank you very much, James. No, we're not. <laughs> Something's not right here. Bear with me. There we go. Got it working. See what happens when you put two idiots together? It sometimes works. <laughs> you and I are both having problems with this pulling, James. Okay, one of the things that we were talking about is the byproducts of mixing. You get CO, CO2, water, H2. Some are insulators, some are conductors. One thing to keep in mind, if you've got an incomplete burn on your furnace, you get that lazy yellow, it's got a lot of carbon. As soon as you see really a lot of yellow inside that flame, you got a lot of carbon there. That can inhibit flame rectification, believe it or not. What you want is something like this. A nice crisp blue flame with a little orange tipping. A little fun fact, that orange tipping is actually the particulates in the air burning up. That's what the orange. But you want it blue, not yellow, and you get good conduction. All right. So let's know how it's a flame, because I got a question for you. If I put 100 volts through the wire, this has 100 volts here, and this is my ground, and I got to have a path of ground to flow, if there's no flame, I got an air gap, right? Nothing happens. What if I were to touch these two pieces of metal together? Would I get voltage flowing? What do you think, yes or no? Yeah, you sure would. So here's the question that you want to start figuring out in rectification. How do you know that it is a flame instead of a direct short to ground? Big honking piece of rust, a dead mouse or whatever. How do you know that not a bridge to ground? And that's where the rectification portion comes in. I still float 100 volts this way. But when I get to the ground, I go through a thing called rectification. If I got a direct short to ground, no rectification occurs. The board can sense that, and it will not allow the system to operate. Has to do with the ground here. So let's go and understand how this thing works. Rectification acts like a bridge rectifier. Anybody that's got electronics background, you know what a bridge rectifier does? It converts AC, alternating current, plus or minus, to DC, direct current, where it only pulses on one side. And the way it does it, and this is not how it actually works, I'm just using this for an analogy, all right? So don't anybody try and hit me with a question on that. These little things here, the little triangle things, are called diodes. The flats that you see on here are called gates. And it's nothing but a check valve for electricity. That's all a diode does. It allows electricity to flow one way, but it won't let it go backwards. It'll go one way, like a check valve for uh, water. If you got a sprinkler system, you need a check valve on the potable water side. You might have a check valve in a heat pump so you don't get reverse refrigerant flow. A diode's nothing but a check valve for electricity. And look what happens. I'm pulsing plus, minus, plus, minus 60 times a second, right? I pulse plus and it goes through just fine, but when it back pulses to go to the negative side, what's the first thing it hits? The gate of the diode that does not allow the diode to allow the voltage to pass through. And what are the diodes are tied to on the back side? Ground. That's your ground symbol. So I am literally physically denying the negative portion of the sine wave to get all the way through the circuit. Your flame acts exactly like that like a bridge rectifier. And I'm going to try and explain how that works. Here's your 120 volts pulsing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. We use 100 volts because we're looking for a reference voltage. It won't be as true 120 volts. A lot of guys ask me, is it supposed to be 120? No, it's closer to about 100 volts. Whether it be a Honeywell, a White Rodders, Robert Shaw, Fenwall, we all operate pretty much the same. 
but we're trying to find that ground path through the flame. Here's what happens. The size of the flame probe, if you look at this flame probe right here without the wire on, it's going to be about an eighth inch diameter and only about roughly that much that I'm holding between my uh, thumb and forefinger is what's in the flame. It's a very small surface area. How big is the ground inside of a furnace? Massive! The whole thing is, it is, all of it's ground. So you get a very small flame probe, a very large ground, and because of the dissimilar mass, what will happen is that the current can flow very readily in one direction, but it is impeded based upon the size of the ground in going the second direction or the negative side. And what happens is our friend Ohm's Law comes into place. I stands for amperage, voltage, resistance. Voltage, 100 volts. Resistance, whatever the flame resistance is, and it's a really high number. You take that into voltage and you'll get your current, your intensity. And we measure intensity in microamps. Now, if you get hit with five amps, five amps, a heavy load, it'll knock you across the floor. It hurts. You get hit with milliamps, you might possibly feel a tingle because that's a millionth of an uh, amp, so it's not a lot. A microamp is one billionth of an amp. It's nothing. It is so hard to measure because it's so small, microamps. And what we're looking at is what the microamps will be based upon 100 volts and the quality of the flame as it's trying to find the path to ground. So in rectification, that's exactly what we do. We pulse one way, we inhibit coming back the other way. As long as the flame's present, we can do that. No flame present, we got a real problem, no electrons flow. So here you see where you have your alternating current, but because it's rectifying, I just get a DC input. Here's your furnace inside the vestibule itself, all the metal, the ground. So I'm getting a DC sine wave going through the system and returning to the control. And it returns through the ground plane, which is the burner vestibule, and it eventually goes to the burner manifold. You got that little green wire on there that goes back to the control. That's your return path for ground. Now, why do we want to understand this? I took about 10 minutes of your life, it'll never get back to talk to you about ground. Because that's really what the issue is. The majority of times, it could be the probe, but I've run into so many calls on our tech services because the tech services group works for me. Guys, we get four or 500 phone calls. I dread this time of year because I'll get four or 500 phone calls in a day from contractors all over North America. And the first six weeks of winter, the majority of the questions are flame rectification. And it comes down to oftentimes it's the ground and not the probe. The ground instead of the probe. Here's what happens. Board, 100 volts, comes in, gets this flame, it closes as a switch, the flame's a conductor, allows the electricity to go to the ground, and if I got a firm ground plane, I got this massive ground. So explain to me, if you could, anybody, why is it that if I look at the sine wave here, the return to the board, I'm getting five mic ramps based on Ohm's law on the plus side, but I'm only getting one micro ramp on the back side. How is it possible for that to happen? I'm going to give you the best analogy I can. Matt, would you mind volunteering? Sure. Okay. All right. Have you ever skied shot with a shotgun? Mm -hmm. Okay. I got a burly 12 gauge side by side, all right? You're going to be the clay pigeon puller, right? You're in the pit. <laughs> Off goes the pigeon. You cool? All right. Pull. <laughs> Boom. 25 yards out, I nail that bird. I nail it. How many pellets do you think came out of the barrel of the gun when I pulled the trigger? In a 12-gauge bird shot shell, how many pellets do you think are in there? 100, 150, 200? There's a bunch. I don't know. I've never taken the time to count them. Number four shot, by the way. I'll at least give you that hint. All right, you ready? Now, by the way, Matt, when I shot, how many pellets do you think actually hit it at about 25 yards? If I had, say, 100, a few? Enough to break the clay pigeon, because guess what? Coming out of the barrel, I'm this big. 25 yards out, I'm probably this big. 40 yards out, I'm probably this big. 
So it doesn't mean I'm a really great shot. I just wait for it to get a little farther away and I get a bigger pattern moving. I'm going to get it every time. All right. You ready? Here. 25 yards out. Big pattern. You ready? Pull. I placed the barrel on his forehead. Boom. And I pulled the trigger. What did I just do? Sorry, Matt. You're out of here. I don't think he thinks I like him. What do you think? <laughs> what did I just do when I placed a barrel on his forehead? I blew his head off. Now explain to me something. If I was 25 yards out and I shot at you, I'd hit you with some of the pellets. I'd probably get Patrice with some of them, probably get him over there with some of them. But if I put it right on your forehead, 100% of the force comes in. What changed? Distance. You know what we call that in electronics? Ground ground. If I got a really large ground, I'm way back here. But as my ground gets smaller, I start concentrating the amount of electrons, the force. And it's literally going to do something like this. I got five microamps on the top. I got one microamp on the bottom. And by the way, when you're reading your meter, what you're reading is the difference between this and this. <laughs> five amps versus one. I got four microamps on there. But if I make this thing smaller, look what happens. I got a small fixed area and large fixed area. Watch what happens when the ground reduces. The half cycle right here increases, the negative side increases, because I'm concentrating more of the force. If I take that 12 gauge, more pellets keep hitting them. And the closer I get, more pellets keep hitting them. Until I place that barrel right on his head and I blow his head off because 100% of the force hit him. You know what that is? A direct short. That's what it is. When I put that, it's just like a direct force short and all the power goes in there. So a reduced ground area does the exact opposite you would think. A reduced ground increases the negative side. And if we're going to read the microamps, if I've got five on the plus, and it gets smaller and smaller, so the number keeps getting bigger and bigger, and I go up to four microamps, What's 5 minus 4? I got one microamp. And it may hold in, it may not. Because here's the other scary thing. We work in billionths of an amp. My gosh, look at this. Fenwall has the biggest dog out there. Right there, their minimum current is 5 microamps. That's a lot. 5 billionths of an amp. Start getting down into Johnson and White Rogers controls. We have controls working down to 0.1 microamps. That is nothing. And if you have any issue with the ground plane or the flame probe inhibiting the electron flow, you're going to reduce the microamps because you get a smaller surface area to work with. Remember how, what? Wrong way. Remember, smaller the area, the more the negative goes up. You take the plus minus the negative, what's left over is what you're reading on your meter. That gets big, that number gets small, the exact opposite. It's about ground. Had nothing to do with the dirty probe. Had nothing to do with it. All about ground. Grounding, and I can tell you this, guys, because myself and my team answer those phone calls. I got 14 people answering the calls when you guys call in. Four to five hundred calls, and a lot of the ground issues, or a lot of the flame rectification issues, all has to do with ground. Drives you nuts. And the problem is, you got three grounds that could potentially be your issue. You got an earth ground, you got a neutral quasi ground, you got the flame sensing ground. Any one of those three can create the issue. Now, thank God, nowadays, the control board's manufacturers, whether it be Carrier or White Rodders or whoever that is manufacturing the board for the OEMs, we're putting in circuits to make it easier for you to check flame rectification. If you don't have a good ground, most of them have little blinky lights on them and say, hey, you got a bad ground. But how do you check the grounds? So there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Here's what I'm going to suggest you do on the flame rectification side. Remember, I was out on that job with Ms. McGillicuddy, fired the unit off, and said, hey, it's a bad flame probe, I gotta go and clean it off. So I moved everything out of the way and took out the flame probe. When I moved all those wires out of the way, what else do you think I moved? The ground wire, the little green wire that goes to the burner manifold. 
We're working with a billionth of an amp, a microamp, which is nothing. You can literally have a film on your ground plane that is enough to inhibit electron flow. Just a film. And it won't burst through. It won't punch through. Now, you put five, ten amps on there, it'll burn through anything. But a microamp, it doesn't take, you can't even see the corrosion occurs. And here's the kicker. What are the byproducts of combustion? Hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and a whole bunch of other chemicals I can't spell. They create films of corrosion on your quarter-inch spade terminals or your ring terminals on the burner manifold that will result in you not having a good, firm, ground bonding plane. And that's the key to keep in mind. So before you do anything on the cleaning, etc., if you got a flame rectification issue like Mrs. McGillicuddy, here's what I suggest you do. Before you move anything around, fire the unit off, make sure the gas valve opens, lights the gas, holds in five seconds or so, and shuts down. Now you've proven you got the problem. Now let's go fix it. Before you do anything, just go wherever the green wire is, usually on the burner manifold, and just gently do that. Go to the board where the ground wire is and just gently move it. That's all you got to do. And then fire the unit off. If that unit holds in the second time after touching the ground lead, what was your problem, ground or flame probe? It was ground. You don't want to call back over something you didn't realize because I don't know about you guys, but I have fixed jobs that I have billed customers for and I have no clue what I did. Put my hands on it and it starts working. We've all been there. Don't be like that. Understand what the problem is and fix the root cause of the problem. Don't get a call back. It's expensive. It's a waste of time. Your boss ain't going to be happy with you. The homeowner's not going to be happy and your reputation gets soiled. Get it right the first time. You can check earth ground with a bunch of different ways. This happens to be a little thing I put together. All this is, literally, is 18 gauge wire with an alligator clip on the end. Now on the other end, I got a regular 120 plug but I got news for you. There's only one wire on here. And you don't want to know where the wire's hooked up to? The ground stud. I have nothing on the hot neutral lines, just on the ground stud. If you want to check to see if the furnace is completely grounded, you can either A, go to the breaker box, put that on the ground, hook this to the unit and see if it holds in. Or if you happen to have a ground fault interrupter right near the unit, plug it in so that the ground plug actually is in there. Hook this to the unit and see if it holds in. That's a real quick, dirty way for you to check to see if the ground is actually going to be working or not. That's one way. Whoop. Sorry about that. In a pinch, I literally, to check ground, I've used jumper cables out of a service truck. If there's a water pipe right above me, I've done that, and I've proven my point to contractors many times. Put it on there, shake it onto the copper, hang it onto the unit, it starts firing off, you got a bad ground. Maybe the wire got pulled inside the junction box and got pulled loose. Maybe it was never hooked up. Maybe it had some idiot electrician guy. Oh, God, I shouldn't say that. Some of you electricians, right? No, I'm kidding. Maybe some jack leg was out there and he didn't hook the ground up properly to the system. It happens. I know that. So you can test your earth ground with one of those. Check your neutral and check your flame sensing ground. Any one of these are ways that you can verify is the unit properly bonded to ground. In many states in the United States now, it is mandatory you have proper bonding. And it's because of that issue. I could give you a reason why this comes up. This is going back, my gosh, about six years ago. In St. Louis, where I live, we had a drought. It didn't rain from June to August at all. In my backyard, I had cracks that big because we got clay. Everything was drying out. And what was crazy was our tech service AC and ref side of the business we had an abnormal amount of phone calls coming in. And we finally figured out what the problem was because it was all dealing with ground. And I thought, why are we having these ground issues? How do they ground a house? They take a big long stake, they pound it into the ground, hook a big honking wire up it, and pull it into the breaker box. When you get a drought, what happens to soil? Why did my earth start cracking when I have uh, clay? As you dry it out, it pulls away and you get an air gap. And what was occurring was the ground rod, because they weren't properly installed, they were just barely into the ground. When it dried out, it pulled away from it and left an air gap. We didn't have a firmly bonded ground. And it had nothing. As soon as it rained, we finally got rain in August, problems went away. 
Ground will have more problems than just your heating system. It can affect any of the systems in your house. The other issue you run into is polarity. Some older units, they will work even if the polarity is reversed, they will work. So what you want to understand is, is it properly done? Because if you look at the control boards, the gas valve, TR for the return, and the ground are usually bust together. You get the polarity reversed and you're going to have another additional issue. Let's see what happens. Ground, flame rod, 100 volts, right? If I have it properly polaritized, polaris, however you say that word, you got 100 volts coming in to your flame probe, you jump through the flame, you find ground. You're going to have 5 on the plus, 4 on the minus. Remember, you need a huge ground area, you got a small probe. What if I reverse L1 in neutral, so I have the primary polarity reverse, what happens? When it's correct, I'm moving this way. When I reverse polarity, I flip it around 180 degrees and I pulse 120 through the chassis of the unit, go through the flame, and my flame probe becomes ground. How big of a ground am I working with when I'm using the flame probe for the ground? Not a heck of a lot. My surface area is small. That's reducing your ground plane, which means your microamps is going to go down. And it might be enough for the unit to work. I've seen it. Thank God nowadays we put polarity sensitivity on all the control boards. We've learned as an industry. But units that were manufactured in the 90s, they still got a potential for this issue because they didn't have polarity sensitivity. So you want to ensure the polarity is correct, that it's pulsing in the correct area. Otherwise, you get too small of a ground. Small ground, big micro ramps on the negative side, small micro ramps as a result on the meter. You want to watch for what we have for polarity if it gets reversed. Whoop. You want to check it on the primary side, L1 and neutral, and it's real simple. Where's the easiest place to find 120 volts on a furnace? What do you think? Blower door. Remember that little switch you got to hold your shoulder in when you're trying to work on the unit or you put a clothespin on it? The blower door will be the hot leg the hot leg of 120. And so what you want to do to check the polarity on the primary is you want to go to L1, which will be the wire going to the blower door switch, and you want to go to chassis ground. You're going to read 120 volts. If you go to L1 on the blower door switch and you go to ground and you read zero, guess what? You got something reversed. Go over to the L2 terminal, the neutral wire, Take that and go to chassis ground. You got 120 volts between neutral and ground. Your polarity is reversed, and how do you fix it? Matt, how do you fix reverse polarity on 120 volts? Flip the wires. This is rocket science, right? No big deal. I'm going to show you how to do all this in 15 seconds. Check the primary polarity. Now, I'm going to do this polling question myself. In the transformer industry, I mean the transformer industry, not HVAC, HVAC, the th uh, transformer industry, how did they identify the polarity for a low voltage transformer? Because they use TR and TH. They use the same thing right here. Does TH stand for thermostat and does TH stand for transformer in the th uh, transformer industry? Yes or no? What do you think? How many say yes in the room here? Got a couple. How many say no? Got one right back here. Which one do you think it is? False. Because guess what? The transformer industry doesn't call TH uh, thermostat and TR transformer. They call TH transformer hot. H is hot. TR, return, the neutral side, the back side. That's how it's actually called. We just happened to teach it in Votex school and apprenticeships. I learned thermostat and transformer because guess what? A thermostat's a switch. Where do you put switches? On the hot leg of electricity, right? So it just makes sense in HVAC, but really TH is transformer hot, transformer return. And that's important when we go to the secondary. You need to know what the hot leg is of the transformer. And here's where it gets into a real issue. How do you identify the hot leg on a 24-volt transformer inside of a furnace? Has anybody here done it? Using your voltmeter, you would think, oh, I put that there and I go to ground. No. 
you literally have to take all the wires off the back side of the secondary and then check it to see if you can find either continuity or voltage coming through. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a technique where you can use your voltmeter, your voltmeter, right here to check frequency without an oscilloscope to check polarity. And what I mean by that is I'm going to check the phasing. Phasing, 120 volts, 24 volts, are they in phase, both going plus and minus at the same time. And the way I do that is by checking how are the sine waves working on the primary of 120 volts, how is it operating on the 24 volt side. They both should track plus and minus at that same 60th of a second that it occurs. Here's what you do. I got a 120 volts primary, I got a 24 volt transformer. This is my sine wave on the plus side. They should both go plus at the same instance. If that happens, they're in phase. If you have the polarity backwards, your 120 will go plus, but your 24 volts will go negative at that same period of time. And the system will still work. This isn't a dead short, guys. But it just means they're out of phase. It'll still produce power to make the system work. But when the polarity is wrong, it affects your flame rectification circuit. you got to make sure they're in phase, the polarity are all lined up, all the pluses go through the circuit. And the way you do that is by measuring the sine wave, the difference in the peaks. Here's the peak for 120, here's the peak for 24. I want to measure the difference between this peak and this peak. I want to measure here the difference in the peaks. If I'm in phase, literally, you can use a voltmeter. You go to L1. You go to the transformer hot on the 24 volt side. You're on the 120 volt scale, 200 volt scale actually on a digital. Put your probes on there and what you're going to read is the difference between the two voltages based on being in phase or out of phase. L1 and TH. If I put it on L1 and TH, and I get some low number, well below 120, that's telling me they're both going positive at the same time, they're in phase, that's cool. That's all it's telling me, not the polarity, it's just telling me I'm in phase. If I go to L1 and TH, and I read some big number above 120, I'm out of phase. Now why is that important? Matt, what was the first thing we checked? Polarity on the 120, right? So if I go to the blower door and I go to chassis ground, hot leg on the blower door, chassis ground, I read 120, polarity is right on the primary, right? If I immediately go from L1 to TH and I read some low number like 96, if the polarity on L1 is correct and they're in phase, then by deductive reasoning, what's the polarity on the 24 volt side? It's correct because I verified the primary, I verified they're in phase. If they're in phase, it's got to be correct as polarity. They're both going plus. If I got the polarity reversed on the secondary, I'll get a negative, I'll get a big number above 120. That's all the way this thing works. L1 and TH. And you do that, you can verify primary polarity, secondary polarity by checking the phasing. So, Matt, just remember, when you measure between the blower door and the H, you want a small number. Is it going to be 96? Is it going to be 98, 102? Yes. <laughs> it's going to be all over the board, but it's going to be a lot smaller than 120. If you see some big number over 120, you're out of phase. If you're out of phase, your polarity's wrong. And if you verify the primary was quick, it's got to be the transformer. How do you fix it? Swap the wires right here. TR to TH and you now got them polarity. And you measure it on your meter, you'll see that immediately go to a low number between 120. It is that stupidly simple. So, to wrap this thing up, we're going to find out if I can actually do this in 15 seconds or not. All right, now I don't have a voltmeter with me, so I'm going to have to fake this. <laughs> so bear with me. Matt, you got a stopwatch? Oh, he's got to pull out a phone. Can't you be like old school and have a watch with a sweet minute hand like me? I mean, I can't even read it, but I know it's there. All right, you ready? Yep. When I say go, Matt, what I'm going to do is I'm going to verbally walk you through the steps, okay? I'll stand back here so the camera can pick it up. All right? 
go. First thing I do is get out my cigarette and light it up. Take out my meter, 200 volt scale. L1, chassis ground. 120, primary is correct. TH, 98 volts. Phasing is correct. Uh, the igniter's glowing. Nope, don't see no hot spots. Ignition cool, done. How much? 20? I ought to be fired. That was five seconds longer than I said I could do it. <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have had that cigarette, right? <laughs> Literally, guys, L1, chassis ground, L1, TH, measure the voltage, measure the polarity, measure the phasing. That is all there is to this trick. And as the igniter's starting to glow, look for the hot spot. You can eliminate a lot of issues with polarity, grounding, phasing, broken igniters, literally on the first startup when you're doing a clean and check. And this isn't going to show up every darn time, but even if you find this a couple times in a season and you fix it, and all you do is swap some wires, should you charge the consumer for that if you fix a problem? Yeah, you should. It might generate a few more dollars of profit for you. And that's what the game's all about, profitability on service calls. So with that, I'm going to wrap this thing up. I hope you all followed this. I'm sure they'll make these slides available to you if you want. Uh, we will make sure we get this video posted if you want a refresher. And if we can be of any of assistance to you guys as you get into the heating season, obviously call Jackson Systems. they got a great crew here, and they'll be glad to help you any way they can. Uh, thank you very much. James, thanks thank you, for sir. bringing me back. That was great. Appreciate it. I'll have to have you back soon, real yeah. soon. Now I get to drive back to St. Louis tonight. Four <laughs> All hours right. home. All right. Thanks, that. guys. Be safe out there. And that will conclude uh, this first uh, event in our series of our uh, lectures here. Thank you very much for attending, all, all of you here and all of you online. Hope you learned something. I sure did. And we'll be doing it again real soon. This is just the first of many that we're going to be having this season. Remember, we are going to put this video and the rest of them on the website, jacksonsystems.com, so you can go back uh, and watch it and rewatch it as many times as you'd like. So I definitely recommend taking advantage of that. And it's a great training tool. And if you, like you said, if you ever have any questions or need some troubleshooting while you're on the field, don't hesitate to give us a call at Jackson Systems. Uh, we have on-site engineers here that will uh, help you with how, uh, however they can. So with that, I'm James Arnell. Thank you again. We'll see you next time. Take care.